a series that we're doing in James called Down to Earth Disciples. I think we've got a slideshow here. And James, just to give you a recap, James is a letter written by James, a brother of Jesus. And uh, it is a down-to-earth application guide of how to follow Christ. So what we mean by that is there's not a lot of high theology in it. There's, there's not high doctrine. It's, it's very casual. It's generally very easy to understand. It was written in uh, common Greek. Uh, it was written to a church. There we go. It was written in a, uh, in a, in a very common language. And we are uh, going to be going through James as we talk about o- across the summer uh, how we do this thing that we call following Christ or being a Christian, a disciple, a believer. H- how do we do that? How do we live this life? Um, and on the face of it, uh, this is a very simple set of, surf- uh, uh, of verses. Uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 11 gives us a, a scenario and, and James gives us an example of discriminating against people based on how they look. Uh, and I want, we want to talk a little bit about that today and what that means in, in church context. Um, there, were, there were two apples up in a tree, and they were looking down on the world. And the first apple said, look at all those people fighting about race and religion and who's right and who's wrong. Uh, no one seems like they get along with this fellow man. Someday, uh, we'll be the only, uh, well, uh, people won't be left, and it'll just be apples and we'll rule the world. And the second apple said, which of us, the reds or the greens? The point is we can, we can learn to discriminate about just about anything. In his autobiography, Gandhi wrote that during his student days, he read the Gospels and seriously considered becoming a Christian. He believed that the teachings of Jesus uh, would allow him to find the ability or the way to uh, the solution for the caste system in India at that time, which was a a fairly significant problem. It's what uh, Gandhi spent his life uh, uh, protesting against. So one Sunday, uh, he decided to attend services at a local church. And he thought he would go and talk to the minister of the church nearby uh, and discuss becoming a Christian. And when he entered the sanctuary, uh, the usher refused to seat him and uh, suggested that he go worship with his own people. Gandhi left the church and he never returned. And he wrote this in his autobiography. If Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. A couple things about uh, the way this was written in Greek. The first thing you need to know is that uh, the translation of a poor person and a rich person uh, in the scripture is something like this. The, The rich person is described as a man wearing gold rings. And we're going to talk about the New Testament world in just a second and kind of what that means and why that was important. The, the poor person who enters right after in this example James gives us, the, the actual translation is wearing vile apparel. Meaning not just poor. So poor I can smell that guy 15 feet away. That kind of poor. I want to, I want to talk to you about three things today. And, uh, and I want to give you some background on... Uh, the New Testament world and what it meant to be poor and what it meant to be wealthy there. Uh, but in your weekend, there's a section for notes. If you like taking notes, I'm, we're, we're going to have three points today. That's it. You can write them down right now or get back to them. But here they are. We're going to talk about how I view others. We're going to discuss how I view myself. And we're going to talk about how God views me. How I view others, how I view myself, and how God views me. There was not a lot of equality in the New Testament world at that time. In fact, we can look at this scenario and we can be very judgmental very quickly and say, how in the world could you treat somebody that poorly when they walked in the door? But you should understand that as James is primarily writing to Jews, Jews had grown up in a practice in which when you entered the synagogue, when you were in the temple, if you were wealthy, if you were rich, you got to sit at the front because you were closer to the scrolls, and that meant you could be more holy, you could be affected by the scrolls. And if you were not wealthy, <clears throat> find a spot in the back. It was common practice. It was cultural. It was accepted. That changed with believers. That changed with Jesus. It changed with uh, Paul as he wrote his letters. It wrote, as James wrote his, uh, this concept of equality of there being no race and no creed and no man or woman, that really started uh, when, when we saw uh, Paul write to the church of Galatia. In fact, in chapter 3, he wrote, 
Verse 26, you are all children of God by believing in Christ Jesus. All of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ as if he were your clothes. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free person. There is no male or female because you belong to Christ Jesus. You are all one. The concept of equality was exceptionally new to a New Testament believer. And this isn't something that started with Martin Luther King Jr. 60 years ago. This started thousands of years ago when Jesus died on the cross for everyone and his apostles said, there's no difference anymore. So as James is writing to the church, he's trying to let them understand that culturally things have shifted because of Jesus. If we move this forward 2,000 years and attempt to find uh, some parallels to how we treat people today, uh, we don't tend to be as distinct with our discrimination. In fact, uh, particularly over the past 50 years, uh, we've I would like to say that we've erased a lot of racial discrimination, that we've erased a lot of those prejudices, that we've erased a lot of those religious discriminations, but in reality what we've done is we've replaced those with others, and we've been more subtle about it. And so now, we, whether we're Christian or non-Christian, whether we're a believer or we're not, we have found different ways to judge people. Well, we judge them for their income or for their political views or for where they live or how they live or how they dress or what their kids do or don't do. Uh, or how they do in sports, or what sports teams they like. We've just found different ways to judge those around us. But the fact is that we still judge one another. And to understand why we do those things, we understand how we view people, we, we have to understand how we view ourselves. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about today how we view ourselves. What tends to happen as I begin to walk away from God, outside of this relationship with God, when I begin to veer away from uh, God's grace, is I begin to create a value system for myself. We all have a value system. We all have things we believe are important or aren't important. Some of those come from our experiences. Some of those come from how we were uh, brought up. The portion of our value system that is created in absence of God where God is not affecting us, they tend to have a couple things in common, and I want to talk about how we build this value system for ourselves. We tend to find important things that, are, that we're good at, that, are per- that come particularly easy for us. We tend to do the opposite with things that come uh, to us that are difficult, but we'll, we'll cover that in a minute. So in the absence of God, I tend to value things I'm good at. I tend to build some rules of what's important and what's not important to help me understand my performance or my self-worth. Uh, let's see if I can give you a couple examples. If uh, I'm good at uh, business, I tend to uh, I, I, I tend to become performance-oriented around my business acumen, around my business performance, and then I tend to put that onto other people. I tend to judge others. How good is that guy at business? Is he pretty good at it? Is he not good at it? That become valuable to me. Uh, I might do that with uh, parenting. I might just say my kids are very important and that I'm a good dad and therefore, because I view myself that way, I will tend to overlay that onto others too and I will begin to judge people on how good of a parent they are or at least how, how good of a parent I think they are based on my value system. And that we could actually continue to extrapolate this in different areas as we find that we've elevated the value of certain things in our lives and then we, we overlay that on the way we view other people. I'm going to pick a a sillier example so you can understand how far outside of God's will this gets. My girls recently started playing softball. Uh, Two of them, my six-year-old and my eight-year-old, have never played softball before. For that matter, they've never thrown a ball before. So you can imagine these practices are uh, interesting. If you've seen that Hyundai commercial where the the dad can't, this this is what I've been working on for about six months. Uh, and so we practice for a long time, and that generally means I just pick up a lot of balls that are all over the place for hours, and uh, we, we keep swinging. Imagine if, over time, I decided that that was really important. The more I elevated that, how my kids do at softball, the more I would begin to build this performance idea of my self-worth around how my kids performed at softball. What would then happen over time is I would start to judge other people based on how their kids do at softball. Kids, the guy's kid is doing really well at softball. Guy's got it together, he's a good dad. 
kids aren't any good at softball, and aren't a lot that are worse than where my kids are at, but really bad at softball? This guy, you know, this guy, he's not, he's not, a, he's not taking care of his kids. The real funky part of that is that we tend to see ourselves in, in any arena in which we've created this value system, we tend to find ourselves and see ourselves as sort of that perfect balance, right? We're, we're that middle ground. We're just right. And anybody that, George Carlin said this, the comedian, he said, have you ever noticed that anybody going slower than you is an idiot and anybody that's going faster than you is a maniac? We tend to find ourselves, I'm right here. If they're better than me, man, that guy has got it together if they're doing better than I'm doing. And if they're worse, <laughs> you know. I'm the barometer. It's a very self-centered value system if you hadn't noticed this. Pastor Tim calls this letting something else in God's seat. We've talked about this before, right? When we put something else in God's chair instead of God, we can do this with all sorts of things. We can do this with what type of car I drive. We could do this with our job or our money or that promotion or retirement or how our kids behave or their performance or our spouse or I, you name it, we can do that. We can elevate that into a position of too much value. Here's the other thing we tend to do. We tend to trivialize the things that we struggle with. So in my silly example, my kids might be rude and mean and they might uh, be, be terrible to their mom and perform terribly in school and around others and I'll sweep all that under the rug if they're good at softball because I've decided that's important. We do that with our own performance. The things that we're good at and the things we value, they're important. The things that we're not so good at, the things that might be a little tougher, you know what, that's not as big of a deal. Now. The a silly example sounds just like that. It's silly, but the fact is that what we do is we do that with the Bible. We read the Bible. It has some precepts and some things that we should be doing. We tend to pick the things out that we like and sweep away the things that we don't. We treat it kind of like um, a Hodel's buffet. Ooh, I like the orange chicken. I like the brisket. I, like the, I don't like those things. And that's what James tells the, the, the church. He writes, he says, you do well when you complete the royal, royal rule of scriptures, love others as you love yourself. But if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and stand convicted by it. You can't pick and choose in these things, specializing in keeping one or two things in God's law and ignoring others. The same God who said don't commit adultery also said don't murder. If you don't commit adultery but go ahead and murder, do you think your non-adultery will cancel out your murder? No, you're a murderer. It's not like counting calories, where I eat a donut and it costs me 300 calories, so I jog a mile and get it back. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to work off that behavior. No amount of good behavior takes care of the bad behavior. It's not a scale. But we tend to think of it that way, and we tend to skew it to where what's worth more are the things that I've said are important, and what's worth less are the things that I've said aren't important. It's a great system I've got going here. It is much easier as a believer to do some generally accepted things like show up at church or read a Bible or drop something in an offering plate or sing a song and say those are important things. It's much harder to do some of the other pieces of the Bible that says treat everybody, love everybody like Jesus. Even that really smelly homeless guy begging for a meal. Be humble and go ask for forgiveness from your coworker who is always on your case and doesn't deserve it at all. You ever had to swallow some pride and go to someone who doesn't deserve it because you did something wrong and you needed to own up to it even though they're terrible and they're going to remind you about it for months? I like to sweep that one under the rug. It, it is true that some sins have different effects on us than others. Even though God sees sin as equal, it's true that if I m commit murder, there are going to be some different consequences here on earth in our society than, say, me showing up uh, late to something for my wife, although you wouldn't know it. But God sees them as sin. 
Here's what we do when we begin to elevate things and sweep other things under the rug. What we're doing is we're adding value or weight to behavior. We're saying this sin is worth more than this sin. This behavior is worth more than this. We're putting our own values on it. We've created our own monetary sin system. God's perspective, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, God's perspective is so significantly different when it comes to sin. And James calls this out blatantly when he says, oh, you think your non-adultery would cover up your murder? That seems silly. Charles Swindoll, in his book on grace, puts it this way. You want to mess up the minds of your children? Here's how, guaranteed. Rear them in a legalistic, tight context of external religion where performance is more important than reality. Fake your faith. I started this conversation on these 11 verses with this idea that we judge people based on how we view them, and we view them based on how we view ourselves. Now, how do we get to God's perspective of how God views me? I want you to imagine uh, you're playing a board game, and you're winning, you're beating everybody, and you're about to win. And God comes in at the last minute, and he changes all the rules so that people in last place win. This is what James says. I'm going to read it again. It says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? In fact, he actually says, God doesn't operate that way. God changed the rules that you set up. Now, why would it be easier for the poor and the destitute and the homeless and the broken and the hurt, why would it be easier for them to accept God changing the rules? Maybe because if they were struggling so badly that they were ready to give up the game anyways, it would be much easier to accept God coming and intervening and moving them to the winner's circle. Much easier for them than for us who think we are winning the game. And this isn't a theme that is exclusive to James. We hear it from Jesus. We hear it from Paul. In Revelation, we hear it in uh, chapter 3, verse 17 through 22, when uh, the uh, author writes to the church in Laodicea. He says, you say, I am rich and I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Tell me how you really feel. Years ago, my family and I were playing Monopoly. We played a lot of board games. We played Monopoly a lot. And uh, my little brother was probably four years old, just kind of old enough to realize we're playing. It's the first time he saw us take Monopoly out. And he sees us take out all the Monopoly money. And we grew up fairly poor. So my brother sees this and thinks, we're rich. He he thought it was all real. So he thinks, I'm going to get to go buy a toy. And so we're playing, and my brother is stealing Monopoly money and putting it in his pocket, like we don't know, he's four, because he thinks it's real, and if he can get enough, he's going to go to the store and buy toys. And we're like, what are you doing? It's not, there's no value to that. The reason it's so important for us to understand God's view is that the thing you think is so important that you believe will make you happy or prove your worth or make your life better or earn your your favor in God's eyes, it's like taking Monopoly money and going to Bill Wright Toyota and trying to buy a car. How did that go for you? And that's how God sees our efforts to change the value of things here on earth. That's how God sees the rich man who thinks he has it all made and has it all figured out. And like the verses we just read in Revelation, God says, you think that has value? You're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And if you think I'm picking on the wealthy, the fact is that any time you take something and you lift it up and you make it more important than God intended it for it to be, we're trying to give monopoly money real value. When you believe something's holding you back from being happy, oh, if I could just get married, 
if I could just find the right spouse, if I could just have some kids, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just take another vacation, if I could just retire, if I could, if I could just do these things. And it's like, from God's perspective, it's like watching that four-year-old stuffing Monopoly money in his pocket. Not gonna do much for you. So how do we fix this? Because what I'm describing to you is human nature. Where we do it, and we do it all the time. We do it over and over again. We're constantly finding some area in our lives that we're lifting up and making to be more valuable than it really is. And if I can mess up the scriptures, if I can look at the Bible and prioritize things in the Bible correctly and incorrectly and put things above others, how do I fix that formula? Here's what James says. James says we must be dominated by mercy, not judgment. And we can only do that through Christ. In the story of the prodigal son, does everybody remember the story of the prodigal son? It's got to be one of the famous ones. So there's two sons, and there's a wealthy uh, father, and the, the younger son demands his inheritance early, and, which didn't happen. And the, the father gives it to him, and he takes it all, and he goes to Las Vegas, and he rents the penthouse and the Bellagio, and he's just spending it as fast as he has. I mean, just, it's going, 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 right? And he runs through his inheritance in months. And then there's a famine in the land and he's out of money and he's starving and he's in vile apparel and he ends up with a job feeding pigs and he's so hungry he's eating the slop that he feeds the pigs. And he finally realizes even my, my dad's servants, his slaves eat better than this. I'm going home. And he walks all the way home and as he's just within eyesight of his father's land, his father runs out to him and he hugs him in that vile apparel and he takes off those rags and he puts on his fine cloak and he takes off his gold rings and he slides them on his son's fingers and he calls for a feast. And the older son doesn't understand. The older son says, why did he deserve this? Dad, how come you changed the rules? I was winning. I was working hard on these things that I decided had higher value. How could you... How could you do this for the younger brother? And God's perspective says, you can't earn this. If you want to understand how to see people and yourself from God's perspective, you have to make that walk home like the prodigal son did every day. Because you'll never earn it and we'll never deserve it and we'll never work our way there. If you want to stop getting bent out of shape by the rules you've put on yourself if you want to have to if you want to stop having to live up to the standards you've created for yourself you have to turn back to the father every day how do you think the prodigal son felt on that walk home do you think he felt like he uh, he was owed anything dad owes me something do you think he felt arrogant or prideful I think the only thing he felt like he was owed was being disowned. And we're the same way. The Bible tells us the wages of our sin is death. That's all we've earned. God doesn't owe you anything. God freely gave his son to us, and Jesus paid that debt on the cross. And God doesn't play by the rules we make up in our head. And he doesn't value the things you've decided are or aren't important. This morning as the music plays, I want to invite you to do a couple things with me. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just want you to think over a couple, a couple, couple things. I want you to do your best to think about what it is that you find most important in life. What are the things that when you wake up in the morning, they're, they're at the top of the list. Is it, is it family? That's well-intentioned. Is it your spouse? Is it your job? Are you a hard worker? That's good. Is it stuff? Is it family? Is it, is it fun? Is it recreation? What is, what is the most important thing in your life? What's the highest monopoly dollar value you have? you see your life and people's lives the way God sees them? Because the only way 
that you're going to stop that race around the Monopoly board is to stop playing the game. You have to put that fake cash down. You have to turn toward the cross. You have to tell God this, Father, I'm at your mercy and I surrender to you. Today I'd like you to examine your heart and consider if there are some things that are holding too high a value for you that aren't in line with God's perspective. We have to lay the, our, our lives down at the cross every day if we want to keep in God's perspective. If you need to lay something down to God, if you need to get rid of it, you, you know He allows that. Jesus shed His blood to cover those up, to wash them clean, to uncover our eyes, to see the way God sees it. If you want to pray with someone today, we finish up. Pastor Ed's going to be up here at the front. You can come up here. You can pray through this. If you've never prayed a prayer before, asking God to enter into your life and, and take you back like the prodigal son, it's as easy as this. Father, I know your son died for me, and I know I can't do this on my own. And I surrender all that I am to serve you, to be washed in the blood, to be wrapped in fine robes, to be treated as royalty, not because I deserved it or I earned it, but because I don't. Your mercy is so overwhelming. If you're a believer here today, you need to reinvest your life in Christ or reaffirm your faith or just need to hit the reset button. Just ask. Turn toward the cross and make that, make that trip home. Father, we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your, your awesomeness and your mercy, that we don't live lives of judgment, but we live lives of mercy, that none of us deserve what you've given us, but you've given it anyway. Thank you, Lord. Here we go. All right, I do have some announcements that I'd like to make. And uh, the first one is, um, thank you for all of you who are involved in VBS. I'd like to thank you for your participation and all that you, uh, you did. And, and folks, uh, you know, I, I'd just like to give them a hand right now. So I know I see some of you guys in here, our VBS leaders, so give them a hand. We had an incredible time at VBS. Uh, I'm telling you, we reached uh, the community. We reached the target that we were aiming for. And uh, there were a lot of kids from our community around here that really responded. So we're praising God. And um, I'm, I'm thankful. And you know, I, I think uh, as we think about this, we, have you noticed that there's a 4th of July booth out front here? That 4th of July booth, it really helps us to be able to um, fund some of our uh, children's ministry and our youth ministry. So I, I would encourage you uh, to buy your fireworks from there and let your neighbors know uh, that, you know, we got fireworks for sale and it goes to a really good cause. It really helps some of our kids get to camp. And uh, like I said, it, it funds our um, children's ministry. Also, um, there is a women's uh, Bible study coming up and that will be July 8th and that's on a Monday and it starts at 6.30 p.m. So, it, ladies, if you would like to be a part of that, I would encourage you to um, sign up in the back. I believe out in the foyer we have some uh, sign-up sheets for you. And uh, God is good. And uh, ladies, I think that would be a good time for you to get together. 
So if you would stand with me right now, because we are going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for all that you have done. And uh, Lord, I just pray right now that in this time that uh, we've had together, Father, that you have spoken to our hearts, Lord, and that in this moment, Lord, there are some of us here that uh, we're just kind of white knuckling it. Uh, Lord, you, you've ca you're calling us. And uh, for some reason, we may be holding back. So I pray for that person this morning, Lord. I pray that uh, they'll let go and, and let you. And so, Father, we just pray right now uh, that you would do an incredible thing within our hearts. Encourage those who have come for encouragement. And, Lord, let us celebrate with those who have something to celebrate. You are awesome. So we thank you for this time together. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. Join me. 